This is Seth Gruber. Welcome to Unaborted. Thanks for tuning in for this special episode called Stump the Pro Lifer. You see, I was at Washington State University this week in Pullman, Washington, giving a lecture called Stump the Pro Lifer, followed by an hour-long Q&A with the dedicated student organization for human rights and the Students for Life Club, following the Genocide Awareness Project on campus that compares abortion to historically recognized forms of genocide through graphic imagery. So the campus was in an elevated state as it pertains to the issue of abortion. So I was able to come in and make a lecture and give a defense of the pro-life position, what pro-life people believe, why the pro-life movement is not going away, and why the pro-life movement faces its best opportunity now to overturn Roe versus Wade and protect unborn children. So thanks for tuning in. Enjoy this special episode, and we'll be right back. Well, I'd like to start off by saying that I actually identify as a woman, and so as such, I hope that you would respect my position on abortion as someone who, too, also has a uterus. And by the way, I'm actually very pro-choice. I actually identify as pro-choice. You see, I believe that women should have the right to make decisions and choose how they want to live. I believe that women should be able to choose their own health care provider, their own school, their own husband, their own job, their own religion, their own career, when and whether to have sex or not. I support women's choices. However, some choices are wrong. And we as American citizens do have a certain line at which we say that choice is wrong. Regardless of your opinions on the issue of abortion, all American citizens have a line where we say, well, I'm not pro-choice for that choice. That choice is wrong. And the choice to intentionally kill an innocent human being is indeed morally and objectively wrong. So you see, abortion is not about the choice in general, but about what's being chosen. It's about a very specific choice. And that choice is the choice to abort, to dismember the child in the womb, the unborn human being located six inches away in his or her mother's womb. And there's just one question that we really need to answer to determine whether abortion is the kind of choice that should be morally protected for women, or if it's the type of choice that all American citizens reject. If it's the type of choice that we say, no, that's objectively wrong. And to illustrate what that one question is that every American citizen needs to answer, to provide clarity as to whether abortion is a women's rights issue that needs to be protected, or whether it's an intentional act of violence that ends the life of a defenseless, unborn human person. And to illustrate what that one question is, I want to share with you a little brief anecdote, okay? I want you to expand your imagination with me for a moment. I want you to imagine that you have graduated from Washington State University, you've gotten one of your dream jobs, and you found the dream spouse. You've married the man or woman of your dreams, and you have a couple children living in Pullman. And as you're in your townhome one evening, washing your dishes by hand, because unfortunately you haven't been blessed with a dishwasher, your three-year-old toddler walks up behind you. Now your back is turned and your three-year-old toddler says, mommy or daddy, can I kill this? Now with your back turned, what would be the first question you would want to ask in response to that question? What is it? What's he got? Because if you turned around and he was holding a cockroach, You might say, here, son, here's a hammer. Have fun. (laughs) But if he was holding the neighbor kitty, my guess is that you would have a different response. So would I, unless you're a vindictive cat hater, in which case, no judgment. However, if he was holding his little brother by the throat, you need counseling. Because you couldn't answer the question, can I kill this? So you answered the question, what is it? That would trump all other considerations at that point. Most of us don't care about killing cockroaches. Pretty much all of us disagree that it is wrong to kill toddlers or for siblings to kill their own toddlers. So you see, when it applies to the issue of abortion, there's only one question that really matters. We can't answer the question, can we kill the unborn, which, by the way, everyone agrees abortion kills something. And I'm going to share with you this evening how people who are abortion choice activists agree with that. We all know abortion kills something, but what does abortion kill? What is the unborn? 
This question trumps all other considerations in the issue of abortion. If it's a human person who shares our common human nature, then they should care, share our common human dignity and a right to life. However, if it's not a human being, if it's not a person, then have as many abortions as you'd like. Nobody cares. It's no different than clipping your fingernails. What is the un? Born. Greg Kokel, a mentor of mine, says that if the unborn are not human, they're not biologically part of the human species, then no justification for abortion is necessary. You don't need to justify abortion if the thing being aborted is not a person with intrinsic dignity and therefore a right to life protected by our Constitution. But then he says, however, if the unborn are human, No justification for abortion is adequate. No justification in the defense of the intentional killing of an innocent, unborn human being suffices to defend that choice. If the thing being killed, which we all agree abortion kills something, is a human being like you and I. So you see, I am pro-choice on most choices, but some choices are wrong. So I'm going to argue a very simple syllogism this afternoon. I'm going to present you with two premises. I'm going to defend both of them. And if both of them are true and logical and rational, then the conclusion naturally follows. The first premise is this. It is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Premise two being abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. The conclusion, therefore, of course, would be that, therefore, abortion is wrong. Abortion is a moral wrong. It is an intentional choice for death of a human being who does indeed share our common human nature. So for the first premise there, it is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. My guess is is that everyone here would agree with that premise. Because we all reject the killing of toddlers, we all reject sexual violence, we all reject rape, we all reject violence committed against innocent human beings because we recognize that human beings have intrinsic dignity and worth. And the lives of men, women, and children ought to be defended from those who seek to do them harm. So my guess is is that we can all get on board with that premise. It is always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Now, if you identify as pro-choice, perhaps you might have the objection, well, hey, you're pro-life, but do you support war? Do you support war? Because that would not be pro-life. You would be supporting the killing of human beings, and therefore, you could not adequately defend that premise. But I'm not arguing tonight that all killing is always wrong. And I think all of us would probably defend a woman who acted in self-defense as a man was seeking to rape her or murder her. I think we would all say, no, that was justifiable killing because someone was seeking to do her harm physically, bodily, that could have even ended in her death. So I'm not arguing tonight that all killing is always wrong, but that intentionally killing innocent human beings is always wrong. And I would hope that we could at least share a common ground with that first premise, that it is always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. If we don't share that premise, we cannot function as a society. If we cannot share that premise, we have moral chaos because anyone can justify violence against anyone if we don't share the belief in that common premise. So the second premise being that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. And if you identify as pro-choice, naturally, this would be the premise that you would take issue with. Because the syllogism is, in fact, logical. It is rational. It is sound. So you would have to reject the second premise if you wanted to avoid the conclusion, which is that abortion is always a moral wrong. And as it turns out, abortion choice Activists and advocates admit this as well. I'm not citing pro-life thought leaders to make the case that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. I'm saying that those on the front lines of the pro-choice and pro-abortion movement are saying that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Here are some examples. Ronald Dworkin, in his 1994 book, Life's Dominion, which defends abortion rights, says that abortion, which means deliberately Intentionally killing a developing human embryo is a choice for death. 
And then Warren Hearn, who wrote the leading textbook teaching doctors and physicians how to perform abortions. It's called abortion practice. He said, we have reached a point in this particular technology where there is no possibility of denial of an act of destruction by the operator. It is before one's eyes. The sensations of dismemberment flow through the forceps like an electric current. Abortion is a choice for death. Naomi Wolf, feminist author and former political advisor to Bill Clinton, in a 1996 New Republic article entitled Our Bodies, Our Souls, wrote this. Clinging to a rhetoric about abortion in which there is no life and no death, we entangle our pro-choice beliefs in a series of self-delusions, fibs, and evasions. She goes on to say, we need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion rights within a moral framework that admits that the death of a fetus is a real death. Fetus, of course, just being a biological term that means a human being at the earliest stages of their development. Embryo to fetus, fetus to infant, infant to toddler. These are terms that describe biological human beings at certain stages in their physical development. And Naomi Wolf, leading pro-choice activist, saying that we lie to ourselves and confuse our beliefs in lies and self-delusions if we don't admit that. Camille Paglia, a pro-choice academic and social critic and professor at the University of Arts in Philadelphia, wrote a 2008 Salon.com article where she said, hence, I have always frankly admitted that abortion is murder. That's a term that many pro-choice activists reject being applied to the issue of abortion because they argue that that's a legal term and you can't properly apply that to legalized abortion. Camille Paglia believes in legalized abortion and says that abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful. Liberals, for the most part, have shrunk from facing the ethical consequences of their embrace of abortion, which results in the annihilation of concrete individuals and not just clumps of insensate tissue. Clearly, abortion choice advocates agree with the second premise that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Well, how about Planned Parenthood? Faye Waddleton, former Planned Parenthood president, in a 1997 interview with Miss Magazine said, quote, I think we have deluded ourselves into believing that people don't know that abortion is killing. So any pretense that abortion is not killing is a sign of our ambivalence, a signal that we cannot say, yes, it kills a fetus. So I'm not saying abortion intentionally kills innocent human beings because that's what the pro-life movement says. I'm saying that because leading pro-abortion activists and advocates are saying that. Now, they're going to reject the conclusion, and I'm going to argue that they're going to adopt the root of intellectual inconsistency because the two premises lead you to the intellectually consistent conclusion that abortion is a moral Wrong. But what kind of being does abortion kill? I'm going to argue that abortion kills an innocent, unborn human being. And I'm going to make a case for the humanity and dignity of the unborn child in a second. But first, if we're going to have an honest debate on abortion, if we're going to meet in the marketplace of ideas and agree to pursue truth, regardless of where it leads us, regardless of the consequences of where the pursuit of truth may lead us, then we need to agree to look at what abortion is and does to unborn children. And of course, this is what the Students for Life Club was promoting this week, which is that if, if abortion is such a great idea, if abortion is integral to maintaining women's rights and integral to ma maintaining women's equality with men, then we should be able to look at what that choice entails. And for those of us that abortion imagery makes very angry and upset, the question we need to ask ourselves is if abortion is such a great idea, why does a simple picture of it make you so angry? If abortion is, in fact, just reproductive health care or reproductive justice, as Democratic presidential candidate Julian Castro recently said. And I'm not saying that the American public should look at abortion imagery because the pro-life movement thinks that they should. I'm saying that because even leading pro-choice activists agree with us. Naomi Wolf, a pro-choice columnist, wrote in a New Republic article that the pro-choice movement often treats with contempt 
pro-lifers practice of holding up to our faces their disturbing graphics. But how can we charge that it is vile and repulsive for pro-lifers to brandish vile and repulsive images if the images are real? To insist that truth is in poor taste is the very height of hypocrisy. Besides, if those images are often the facts of the matter, and if we then claim that it is offensive for pro-choice women to be confronted with them, then we are making the judgment that women are too inherently weak to face a truth about which they have to make a grave decision. Naomi Wolf says that this view is unworthy of feminism. That if you're a feminist and you believe in the equality of men and women, and that women are intrinsically valuable and equal to every other member of the human species and that women are strong and that we shouldn't underestimate what any man or woman can do or can accomplish, then we can't suggest that the pro-choice movement should not look at those type of images. And according to Naomi Wolf, pro-choice activist, that view is unworthy of feminism because it tells women that they're not strong enough to look at the reality of a choice that they may be contemplating in the near future. So I agree with Naomi Wolf. I think that we should examine all of the evidence as we pursue truth on the issue of abortion. So we're going to show you a short 55-second video clip that puts a face to what abortion is and does to whoever the unborn is in the womb. Just as the images on campus this week, it is graphic and disturbing. And so if you'd like to look away, you can practice that autonomy and that freedom to do so. And there is instrumental music over the video clip. So if you choose to avert your gaze, you won't even hear anything that you don't want to hear. But I assume most of you have already seen very similar imagery with the Genocide Awareness Project on campus this week. And so we're going to show you a very short clip to do as Naomi Wolf says and examine all the evidence. Never forget that every clip you, <clears throat> you just saw there, as well as every image on campus this week, were procedures that were protected by law. Every single clip you just saw was an entirely legal abortion, including the final one. Because Roe v. Wade did legalize abortion through the day of birth in the United States of America, while granting states some rights, of course, to restrict abortions up to a certain point. But every late-term abortion imagery that you saw here or on campus this week was entirely legal. And if that imagery disturbs you, let me gently suggest that the reason it does is because abortion is indeed disturbing. These are not doctored images created to elicit emotional responses. This is not propaganda footage in order to sway your emotions towards a pro-life position. This is the reality of what, abor of what every abortion looks like. Now, I want to just give you a brief insight and heart into the pro-life movement and into the students here who lead the pro-life club. In case you are on the other side of the aisle, if you identify as pro-choice or even pro-abortion, I just want you to understand a little bit about the character and intentions behind the pro-life movement. Because in an issue that has divided the American public for nearly 47 years, of course, it's very easy for both sides to demonize the other side. So I just want you to understand that I do speak for the Students for Life Club here when I say that we don't show this imagery to shame or condemn anyone. And I know that that may be hard to understand if you identify as pro-choice. I know it might be easy to assume, that, well, that must be the intention of pro-lifers. Why else use such graphic imagery? But just just like injustice 
just like previous injustice in our, in our history, when they are hidden, they are tolerated. And this is one of the reasons that leading abolitionists in the British colonies, such as William Wilberforce, and leading activists in the civil rights movement all resolved to put a face to racism, to put a face to slavery, to expose the injustice that was largely hidden from the public and from the countries and from, and from the counties where those atrocities were being committed. And so our heart as pro-life individuals is simply to bring moral and spiritual clarity to the issue of abortion by showing the American public what abortion is and does. And as a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I do believe that when people come to terms with what they have done, which is the arranging of the death of an innocent human being, that Jesus, who I believe came down in human flesh as fully God and fully man, is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. So if this imagery convicted you or made you feel bad about maybe a choice that you once made, I just want you to understand the heart behind pro-life individuals, which is not to shame or condemn but to suggest that if abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being, it should be something that we all reject if we claim to be advocates of human equality. And abortion imagery proves the premise that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being probably better than any argument or words that I could articulate. Now, I'm not going to be making a religious case for the pro-life position tonight. You won't hear me cite one Bible verse or cite one theologian to defend the second premise, which is that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. But I wanted you to get a little window into the heart of the pro-life movement and the pro-life club here when we show imagery of abortion. So clearly abortion kills the unborn child. Pro-choice advocates say so, and abortion imagery proves that abortion does indeed kill something. But is it a being like you and I? Does it share our full human nature? Or is it just a potential person? And before it's a full person, maybe we should protect the dismemberment of those children, the suctioning out of the fetal contents, the contents in the womb, which many will continue to argue is simply a blob of tissue. So we need to answer that central question, which I think we can agree is indeed the central question. If you're intellectually honest, I think you have to agree with me that the central question is what is the unborn? If pro-lifers are true and correct when they say that the unborn child is a distinct living and whole human being who shares our common human nature, I don't think any one of us pro-choice or pro-life, wants to defend the slaughter of innocent human beings. So if the unborn is not a human being and is simply blobs of insensate tissue, then have as many abortions as you'd want. That clearly is the central question. So I'm going to defend the pro-life position's argument on the question, what is the unborn? And I'm going to do that by simply examining what the science of embryology says. Like I said, I'm not going to cite Bible verses to say that the unborn is a human being. I'm going to come to the center of the debate and say, we should all agree that biology is a good objective standard to begin the conversation with. What does biology or namely the science of embryology say about the human being in the womb? And this is what the science of embryology teaches us. And unless certain universities ban these books because it leads to a pro-life conclusion, then you'll find this language on any university campus in any embryology textbook anywhere in the country. The science of embryology teaches us that from the earliest stages of development, and that means the moment of conception, the unborn child is a distinct, living, and whole human being. Distinct, living, and whole. These are not terms I've come up with to describe the unborn child in the womb. These are terms that embryology textbooks use to describe the unborn child in their mother's womb. So what do these terms mean? Distinct means unique, right? Distinct means separate. Distinct means not part of your mother's body. But of course, the mantra that we're probably all the most familiar with is my body, my choice. But unfortunately, that argument assumes that there's only one body involved. Obviously, my body, my choice. Well, that's perfectly fine until it is at odds with objective science, because the science of embryology teaches us that the unborn child is distinct. Distinct means unique. Distinct means separate. Distinct means you cannot be part of your mother's body. 
By the way, if the unborn child, because they are unborn and they are a child at a very early stage in their physical development, is simply part of their mother's body, I think we have to come to terms with the very strange intellectual conclusions that follow from that belief system, which is that now we have to admit that pregnant women have 20 fingers, 20 toes, two heartbeats, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types. Oh, and if she's pregnant with a boy, now pregnant women have male genitalia. Most of us reject the intellectual consequences of that position. And the reason we do and the reason we should is not because of personal opinion or religious affiliation, but because of objective science. The science of embryology teaches us that the unborn child is distinct, which means the baby cannot be part of their mother's body. And if the unborn child is part of their mother's body, then why doesn't abortion kill the mother? If it's her body and there's only one body involved, but then abortion choice advocates admit that abortion kills something, why isn't she dead? Because we all know at a deeper level that there's more than one body involved. The unborn child is distinct. The unborn child is living. That simply means that dead things don't grow. And the unborn child meets all of the requirements of a living thing. Now, I have a year and a half year old. So, of course, I watched my wife be pregnant. I didn't have to endure any of the physical um, the physical experiences of what is involved with that, but I did watch her be pregnant, and so I watched my unborn son get larger and larger and larger. And here's something that never happened. My wife never woke me up in the middle of the night shaking me, saying, Seth, Seth, wake up. Come on, whisper to my womb. Remind baby to grow. We don't want him to forget to grow. We have to make sure he grows. And the reason why that is such a silly thing to suggest is because pregnant women and the fathers of unborn children do not will their unborn children to develop. They develop themselves from within. This is why even in uncomfortable pregnancies, most women can still sleep because they're not having to force their baby to grow. It's happening without them trying. That means the unborn child is living. So the unborn child is distinct, living, and whole. W-H-O-L-E. This doesn't mean fully developed. We have a tendency to confuse the term a whole human being with a developed human being. A whole human being is simply a human being that has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. So I'm 28 and I'm not 40. But I have everything that my biologically coordinated human system needs to realize my development as a 40-year-old. Am I 40 yet? No. But I will reach that level of development unless someone dismembers me, unless someone kills me, which is what abortion does. According to the science of embryology, from the moment of conception, the unborn child has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as one of us. They just need time, just like every single one of us just needs time to realize our level of development as 30-year-olds or 40-year-olds. They say men don't reach their mental peak until their 40s, which was very good news for my wife, by the way. So that means that I am still developing. I am not fully developed. And yet I have everything I need to realize my full potential and level of development. That's what the science of embryology says about human beings from the moment of conception. So the unborn child is a distinct, living, and whole human being. This is not about partisan politics. This is not about religious affiliation. This is not about personal opinion. If you care about pursuing truth, you care about objectivity, and you care about science, you have to affirm what the science of embryology teaches, which is that there is a biological human at the moment of conception. So you didn't come from an embryo. You once were an embryo. It's not as if an embryo is some strange blob of tissue that's not biologically human. And then you later change species into human beings because all living things reproduce after their own kind, which means that cats can indeed only produce kitties. Dogs can indeed only produce puppies. And a male and a female can only produce according to their own biology, which would be other biological human beings. This is what the science of embryology teaches us. Keith L. Moore in his seminal work, The Developing Human, Clinically Oriented Embryology, a widely used textbook on university campuses, says that human development begins at fertilization, the process during which a male gamete or sperm unites with a female gamete or oocyte to form a single cell called a zygote. This highly specialized titipotent cell marked the beginning of each of us 
as a unique individual, not as a potential person, not as a blob of insensate tissue that later changed species into a biological human. It marked the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. He goes on later and says that a zygote is the beginning of a new human being. In the pathology of the fetus and the infant, written in 1975, which means we've known this for a long time, it writes that every time a sperm cell and ovum unite, a new being is created, which is alive and will continue to live unless its death is brought about by some specific condition, unless it's dismembered. The same is true with us. We have everything we need to realize our full growth and development as a participating member of the human species unless our death is brought about by someone else, unless we're dismembered, like a third of American citizens have been since 1973. In Langman's medical embryology textbook in 2006, he said that development begins with fertilization, the process during which the male gamete, the sperm, and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite to give rise to a zygote, which is a term to describe a human being at a very early stage in his or her physical development. And this isn't just from those in the embryological or biological community. This also comes from people leading the rights of women to obtain abortions. Anne Feroidi, the chief executive of the largest independent abortion provider in the UK, said in a 2008 debate, quote, we can accept that the embryo is a living thing. In the fact that it has a beating heart, that it has its own gene genetic system within it, it's clearly human in the sense that it's not a gerbil. And we could recognize that it is human life. This woman leads the largest provider of abortions in the UK. And then Peter Singer, one of the foremost pro-abortion philosophers in the country, said in his 1993 Practical Ethics book, quote, whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes in the cell of living organisms. In this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moments of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. And then David Boone, in one of the leading pro-choice voices in his book, A Defense Defense of abortion in 2003 said a human fetus, after all, is simply a human being at a very early stage in his or her physical development. All of these people defend abortion through the day of birth. And they agree with my second premise, which is that abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. And then in 1981, at a United States Senate Judiciary Subcommittee, they received the following testimonies from a collection of medical experts to answer this central question that most of us agree is the central question, which is what is the unborn? Dr. Jeremy Leguin of the professor of genetics at the University of Descartes said that, quote, after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being. It is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is plain experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. And then Dr. Watson A. Bowes of the University of Colorado Medical School said, the beginning of a single human life from a biological point of view is a simple and straightforward matter. The beginning is conception. Do I, do I need to continue? Those in the embryological and biological community and those on the leading front lines of the abortion rights movement all agree that the unborn child is a distinct living and whole human being from the moment of conception and that abortion actually intentionally kills an innocent human being because abortions, of course, are not accidents. Those would be miscarriages. So abortion is intentional. This is what the science of embryology teaches. So if we want to answer the question, what is the unborn? If you're committed to a pursuit of truth, regardless of where it leads you, this is where it leads us. Of course, you can fact check me on all of this. This is plain experimental scientific evidence. We've known it for literally decades. But the science of embryology does not prescribe moral behaviors, meaning that science doesn't inf tell us how to live. Science generally doesn't deal with questions like what makes humans valuable or why be moral. Science gives us biological facts. And as it turns out, many of those biological facts are pretty helpful and necessary to formulate opinions on how we should live and how we should treat other human beings. Namely, if you are all biological humans, I should grant you a certain level of dignity and respect. I shouldn't abuse you. I shouldn't mistreat you. And I certainly shouldn't kill you because we all agree with the first premise that it's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. But unless you're 
biology professor is, is venturing into the realm of philosophy, then they're not going to tell you why those scientific facts have any relevance for how you treat one another. So we have to turn to philosophy, to the questions of ultimate concern, such as what makes humans valuable in the first place? Why should I grant you any dignity, value, or worth? Why are we all deserving of a right to life, which we pretty much all agree that all human beings are deserving of a right to life. So we can use the science of embryology to inform our opinions on the issue of abortion, but we also need to make a case for why we believe that the unborn child has equal intrinsic dignity, value, and worth with every other human being. And this is what the pro-life movement believes, that the unborn child should be granted the same level of respect whether they are unborn or born. So this is what pro-life individuals argue is the case for the equal value, equal treatment, and human equality of all human beings, whether unborn or born. And it goes something like this. It's very simple. There is no meaningful difference between the embryonic human being that you once were and the adult that you are today that would justify killing you at that earlier stage. There's no meaningful difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that makes it okay to kill you, the embryo, because you are indeed the same person now that you were as an embryo. According to the science of embryology, every human being had a, a neat beginning at conception. Yes, you look different than you did at eight weeks in your mother's womb. Yes, you're more developed. And yes, we could not recognize the prenatal photo of you placed up to a photo of you today, but it is indeed the same you. And so the case for the equal value of the unborn child is that whatever differences we find between unborn people and born people, none of those differences are relevant to the question, what makes humans valuable? Now, are there differences between unborn people and born people? Of course, like I just said, none of us could identify a picture of you in the womb with you today. You've changed. There are differences. And the big four main differences are summarized in the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D. That's a very difficult concept for me. I live in Southern California. I don't even know how to spell the word snow. But SLED up here probably has more relevance. S stands for size. L stands for level of development. E stands for environment. And D stands for dependency. And I'm going to go through each one because these are indeed the four differences between who you used to be in your mother's womb and who you are today. And the pro-life movement argues that those differences are not relevant to human value, meaning that the differences between unborn people and born people cannot be used to justify the abortion of unborn people. Because unborn children differ from us in the same ways that we differ from one another, which means none of those differences are relevant to the question, what makes humans valuable? S stands for size. Yes, it's true. The unborn child is smaller than the newborn child. Just like the newborn child is smaller than the toddler, and the toddler is smaller than the teenager. Just like me at six foot three, I'm generally larger than 95% of the audiences I speak to. Guess what? I don't have more value than you, do I? Pro life individuals, believe it or not, if you're pro choice, believe that pro choice individuals have the same equal level of intrinsic dignity, value, and worth as us. Yes, we believe that abortion is wrong, but we believe that if you're pro-choice, you have the same equal level of intrinsic dignity, value, and worth and have a right to have your life protected from violence or killing. Why? Because human value is not dependent on our differences. It's dependent on the fact that we share a common human nature. So simply because I am larger than you does not mean I have more value because your siblings maybe or your cousins are smaller than you, that doesn't mean that they have less value. Men are generally larger than women, and that has no relevance to the question, what makes humans valuable? We have equal dignity, value, and worth regardless of our size. So if we would reject the killing of born people based on their size, we have to equally reject the killing of unborn people based on their size if they share our common human nature because we all agree with the first premise that it's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. L stands for level of development. Yes, it's true. The unborn child is less developed than the newborn child, but the newborn child is less developed than the toddler and the toddler is less developed than the teenager. I'm probably more developed than most of you if you're a university undergrad student right now because I'm 28. I graduated in 2014. But I don't have any more value than you. 
I don't have a greater right to life, and I'm not intrinsically more valuable than you are, despite the fact that I'm more developed. Your grandparents are not more valuable than you simply because they're more developed. Because human beings are equally valuable, period, because they share a common human nature, not because they're more or less developed. So if we would reject the killing of born people because they're less developed, we have to equally reject the killing of unborn people, if even though they're less developed than us. So size, level of development, and then E stands for environment or location. And this is one of the primary arguments for abortion, right? Most abortion choice advocates maintain that a woman has a legal and moral right to end her pregnancy to obtain an abortion through all nine months of pregnancy because the unborn child is in the womb. And once that baby's grown, most pro-choice advocates at that point believe that it would be wrong to commit infanticide. It would be wrong to kill a born baby. And I'm glad, I'm thankful for that middle ground area that all pro-lifers and pro-choicers can come together on and say, can we at least reject the killing of infants outside the womb? But your location has no relevance to your human value. It doesn't. We're all in different locations right now. But it would be a ludicrous suggestion to say that I have more value than you because I'm in a different location. Well, the unborn child is located six inches away in their mother's Womb. And our country says, because of Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, that abortion is a moral and legal right through all nine months of pregnancy simply because the unborn child is located six inches away in their mother's womb. And once they complete a six inch journey through the birth canal, which apparently magically confers personhood, that the unborn child is now a full person with a right to life that ought to be protected under the Constitution. But where one is has no bearing on who one is. We do not have value because of the location that we find ourselves in. Because the distance between you and I right now is obviously a significantly further distance than the unborn child travels during childbirth. Six inches. And one of the pro-choice arguments for abortion is that it's okay as long as they're in the womb. But unborn children are not part of their mother's body. They're located inside their mother's body six inches away. And where one is has no bearing on who one is. So if we would reject killing any of you because you just happen to be not where I am, then it's just as ludicrous to suggest that it's okay to kill unborn children because they're not located where you are. Size, level of development, environment or location, and degree of dependency. This just means how dependent you are, right? Can you survive apart from any type of help? Or are you dependent on people or certain things for your continued life? And yes, the unborn child is dependent on the mother, correct? And in the first trimester and early second trimester, the unborn child cannot survive apart from his or her connection and dependency on their mother. Though medical technology and scientific advancements are enabling us to make unborn children not dependent on their mothers earlier and earlier and earlier, meaning thanks to medical advancements, the baby can be made independent, viable at earlier and earlier stages than last year, than two years ago, than 10 years ago, which by the way, if you've noticed it, is a very interesting critique of one of the pro-choice arguments. Many pro-choice moderates who do reject abortion through all nine months of pregnancy argue that abortion is okay when the baby is not viable, meaning when the baby is dependent on the mother for his or her continued life. Once that baby is viable, not dependent, and can survive outside the womb, then abortion's wrong. Now, pro-choice advocates never offer a case as to why dependency is value giving in the first place. They merely assume it. But dependency has no relevance to human value. And if it does, then we'd be forced to say that human value and human rights, they're not objective. They just constantly shift and change based off of advancements in science. Because as medical technologies enable us to save prematurely born babies or make them independent earlier and earlier and earlier, then human value changes along with medical advancements if the pro-choice argument is correct that abortion is wrong because the baby has value after viability. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because human value is not based on your dependency. It's based on your human nature. And we believe that all human beings should be protected from being unjustly killed. Furthermore, there are plenty of born people who are dependent on heart pacemakers, kidney machines, insulin, and life support. 
These are born human beings that are dependent on something without which they cannot continue to live. And if we say that human rights, a right to life, is present once you're independent, not dependent on someone or something else, then we'd be forced to accept the conclusion that it's okay to kill all born people, dependent on others or dependent on certain medicine to continue to live. Because we reject where that reasoning leads, we ought to reject the reasoning in the first place, which is that human value is based on your dependency. It's not. It's based on the fact that we share a common human nature. Size, level of development, location, and dependency, these are the four differences between the unborn person that you used to be and the born person that you are today. And none of those differences are relevant to human value. And if you would reject the application of those four differences to justify killing born people, you have to equally reject the application of those four differences to justify killing unborn people. If those unborn people are people, if they're human beings who share our common human nature, if you want to be an advocate of human equality, you have to maintain that it's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings, regardless of their size, their level of development, their location, or their degree of dependency. So notice, I've just made a case for the intrinsic value, dignity, and equal worth of the unborn child. And I've done it without citing Bible verses to make my case. I'm not offering a religious argument as to why you should be pro-life. I'm saying that this is necessary if you believe in human equality. I am the equality advocate. The pro-life movement are the equality advocates because they're saying that it is always wrong to kill human beings, whether they're unborn or born. And because we wouldn't accept those differences to kill born people, we shouldn't be accepting them to kill unborn people. The unborn differs from us in the same way that we differ from one another. So when you look at one another, when you walk by each other on campus and you look at one another, ask yourself the question, what do we all have in common? What makes sense of human value? It can't be found in our differences. It can't be found in randomly, arbitrarily selected criteria, such as convenience, wantedness, size, level of development, dependency, environment. Because guess what? None of us share those capacities or functions equally. If you ground human value in things that human beings don't share equally, then those who have a greater degree of those functions have a greater right to life. That's what's dangerous about grounding human value in capacities or functions that we don't share equally. Only by saying that human beings have intrinsic dignity, value, and worth in virtue of being human beings, of having a human nature, can you maintain human equality. If we don't ground human value in our common human nature, then we are left with a very problematic philosophical worldview called functionalism, which says that your value is found in your functions. What functions? Well, whatever functions the power class decides are necessary for a right to life. Might makes right when functionalism reigns. This is what happened in the Holocaust. This is what happened in slavery. A group of people, atrocious human beings, who described Jews and blacks as subhuman, and that was morally wrong, decided that to have value meant to have pale skin. To have value meant to be Aryan. What made those functions value giving in the first place? Nothing. It was merely assumed by a power class in control. And if that's what explains human value, then might makes right. And those on the lower on the totem pole are screwed. That is what is present in the ideology of the pro-choice worldview. Because it doesn't say that all human beings have an equal right to life. It says that if you're in the womb and you're smaller, less developed, and more dependent, you can be dismembered, and that's a woman's moral choice. Why? No defense is given as to why those differences are value giving in the first place. It's merely assumed. And this leads to many moral dilemmas. Recently, we've seen this in our politics. In 2002, under the Bush administration, there was a piece of legislation called the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. And it simply said that if you survived an abortion, meaning that babies who were supposed to be aborted were born alive and the abortionist botched the abortion and now the baby is born, it escaped their abortion through the birth canal, that that baby is a human being with human rights. That's basically what the legislation said. Pretty straightforward. It had nothing to do with abortion. It only spoke to what happens after a baby is out of the womb, through the birth canal, in a failed abortion. 
That bill in 2002 received bipartisan unilateral support across both sides of the aisle from Republican and Democratic senators. Naturally, we all think it's wrong to kill infants who are already born, even if they were born because of a failed abortion. Well, in February of this year, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska pr proposed a piece of legislation called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, in large part because Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia went on a radio show and asked the question, what would you do with a baby who survives a botched abortion? And he said, well, I'll tell you, quote, we would make the baby comfortable. We would, we would resuscitate the baby if that's what the mother wanted. And then the mother and the physician would have a conversation about a baby asleep, wrapped in swaddling clothes, already born. There's nothing to have a conversation about. House Republicans just hosted three medical experts in Congress to testify about their experiences in hospitals they've worked in where infanticide was being performed and not reported, where babies who survived abortions were being thrown in bottles of saline solutions or thrown in the trash and not reported. Now, are these the large percentage of abortions? No. It's a small percentage. But when there's a million abortions every year in the United States of America, small percentages represent large numbers, don't they? So Senator Ben Sass says, here's a bill. It's an improvement on the 2002 Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Here's all it says. If a baby survives a botched abortion and is born, that baby has to be given the same level of medical attention and care as any other baby born in normal circumstances. I hope we could all get on board with that. If you're born, even if it was because of a failed abortion, you should now be given the same level of medical attention and care as any other baby born during normal circumstances. Secondly, that abortion survivor needs to be immediately transferred to a hospital. Why? Because as it turns out, abortion clinics are not created to preserve life, they're created to end life. They're not equipped, literally, to save life. They have forceps intended to dismember life in the womb. Thirdly, if the staff at an abortion clinic don't report the fact that a baby survived a botched abortion, they will have legal repercussions. And if the abortionist murders that born alive infant, he'll be charged with the murder of an innocent human being. Notice this bill had nothing to do with abortion except in the title, Abortion Survivors. It had everything to do with what to do with the baby after it's born. Well, if you follow politics, then you'll know that in February, only three Democrat senators voted for that bill. In 2002, every single Democratic senator voted for a bill that recognized abortion survivors as human beings with human rights. Why do I tell you this? Because ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. The bad idea that human value is not intrinsic to every human being, but it's based on randomly, arbitrarily selected criteria that the power class gets to create leads to these types of consequences, which is a failure to even condemn infanticide. Because if human value is based on your wantedness and convenience, which is one of the primary arguments for abortion, mothers who do not want their unborn children should not be forced to have them. It's one of the most fundamental pro-choice arguments. We shouldn't be forcing women to have babies they don't want. If your human value is dependent on your wantedness and convenience to those who are stronger than you, we are all screwed. Because those who are lower on the totem pole, ideologically, can have their rights stripped from them if you're being intellectually consistent. When you, it, when you consistently apply pro-choice ideology, it justifies infanticide. Because if a mother has the moral and legal right to arrange the death of her unborn child in the womb, why should that right be taken from her one minute and six inches later? Only one minute has passed from when her baby was unborn to born. Only six inches have passed from when that baby was unborn to born. What was so meaningful about those 60 seconds and those six inches? Nothing. Nothing is meaningful about those differences. So if she should have the moral and legal right to kill her baby in the womb, why not outside the womb? If human value is merely based on convenience and wantedness, that infant is still inconvenient and still unwanted. So kill it. Ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. This is functionalism. This is the worldview that says human value is based on your functions and capacities. Well, which ones? Well, whatever ones the stronger people decide. Might makes right. This was exactly the type of worldview that Abraham Lincoln was fighting in the 1850s. This is the exact worldview that Abraham Lincoln railed against in his debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858. Here's what Abraham Lincoln, of course, one of the leaders 
in rights for all human beings, regardless of their skin color, said regarding the same ideology, the same worldview of functionalism and a performance view of personhood. He said that you say A is white and B is black. So it is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. He's saying that if the criteria you develop for human value is that people with lighter skin have more value and people with darker skin have less value, if you consistently apply that criteria, then you have less value than anyone else who has lighter skin than you. Ideas have consequences. He goes on and says, you do not mean color exactly. Okay, let's move on to a different argument. You mean that whites are intellectually the superiors of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. If you ground human value and level of intellect and you consistently apply that, then you have less value than anyone else who is more intellectually superior to you. Lastly, he says, but say, but you say it's a question of interest. Okay. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. Slavery had the same ideology as abortion, which is that human value is not intrinsic and granted to all human beings. It's merely dependent on a power class that decides which human beings have value or not. And genocide has always entailed the dehumanization of an entire victim class that they wanted to eliminate or mistreat. Because if you can convince society that those group, this group of biological humans over here, while biologically human are not persons because they're lacking in certain criteria, then you can justify anything. Ideas have Consequences. When we define human value or ground human value on arbitrarily selected criteria that the power class gets to determine, then human equality is destroyed. You can throw human equality out the window. It's a myth because you can't make sense of human equality based on things that we don't share because all human beings differ. It's only by grounding human value in our shared human nature that we can ensure human equality and dignity for all people. So my premise is simple. It's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being, and it utilizes an ideology that is a fatal misstep in our history by applying human value only to those that we deem convenient and wanted without explaining why convenience and wantedness are value-giving capacities in the first place. And we put ourselves in a dangerous position of enabling other people to dehumanize us if they find us unwanted and inconvenient. If these two premises are true and rational, then the conclusion naturally follows, which is that abortion is a moral wrong. I have presented and adequately defended the two premises, so the conclusion necessarily follows. The issue of abortion fits into the larger issue of human equality. Who gets to live and who gets to die and who gets to decide who lives and who dies? I am the equality advocate. Pro-life advocates are the equality advocates. They are advocating for the basic right to life and value of all human beings, whether born or unborn, because according to the science of embryology, the unborn is a biological human who was a distinct living and whole human person from the moment of conception. So abortion is a moral wrong because it is a wrong choice for the death of an innocent baby, a human being who differs from us in the same ways that we differ from one another, namely according to size, level of development, location, and dependency. If you want to succeed in making a case that abortion is a moral right and the pro-life movement is wrong, then you must either disprove the science by showing that unborn entities are not human beings and therefore abortion is perfectly acceptable because if the unborn is not a human being, then the procedure of abortion is no different than clipping your fingernails. Or you must illustrate why large and developed born human beings have a right to life while small and dependent unborn human beings don't have a right to life. 
but you're going to have to do this without accidentally justifying the killing of born people at the same time. Because if you ground human value in capacities and functions we don't share, then you justify killing all born human beings who don't share those same capacities. However, if anyone can do one of these two things, I will surrender my position and adopt the pro-choice position. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the lecture and this special episode of Unaborted this week. Hey, before we get to the Q&A with the students at Washington State, I just want to briefly invite you to engage further on the issue of abortion by becoming a patron of the show. Hey, if you just enjoyed that lecture and you think that's valuable, well, this show aims to take that same type of content, that same type of training, that same type of examinations of ideas and the consequence of bad ideas and bring that to the American public and bring that to Christian leaders, lay people, young people, pro-life students, and give them the tools of thought and resources they need to go out and be effective on the battlefield of abortion. Go to bat for unborn children and defend life at this propitious moment in our country's history. So if you want to join this show and help us expand the reach of the show, expand the production value and bring on guests and make a one-stop shop for pro-life individuals to get encouragement, equipping, and training to go back out and be a voice for the unborn, then become a patron of the show. Head on over to patreon.com slash unaborted. That's patreon.com slash unaborted. We can't do this without your help. Unfortunately, the abortion industry is a money-making business, and they make a lot of money on the killing of children. But the pro-life movement spends a lot of money trying to save children. And this show is an important contribution to equipping and training and raising up the next generation of defenders of life to be just that, defenders of life. So if you've appreciated this content, consider becoming a patron of the show patreon.com slash unaborted. Now enjoy this hour-long Q&A with the students at Washington State. How's it going? What's your name? Uh, my name is Carl. Kyle, good to meet you. Carl. Carl, thank you. So um, I have two questions today. And uh, before I ask you my questions, I want to let you know that I was... Uh, an atheist. I was born and raised in a communist uh, regime, and uh, I am now a chemical engineering wow. uh, student. Awesome. And uh, but I studied biology for a long time, and uh, currently I am also a Christian in that pro uh, chron chronological order. So I have two questions uh, that is uh, that are more involved with our legal system and uh, our economic state. So the first question is, um, what is your opinion on the claim that Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood uh, engage in illegal organ trafficking? In other words, they engage in uh, illegal supplying aborted fetus part for stem cell research. Right. Uh, the second question is, uh, well, well, I think that providing a lot of facts and details and opinions uh, from many prestigious professors and um, medical researchers is useful, but it's not exactly helpful in answering this question. Why do we have laws against animal cruelty? That is, people are punished severely under the law if they cause uh, unnecessary suffering for an animal. If development of such laws is an example of uh, the evolution of our empathy, our humanity, then why is it, it is um, acceptable to remove the same treatment from a fetus? And why is it acceptable under the law to dismember any fetus at all? Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your question. So in regards to the first question, um, currently David Daladine, who's the executive director of the Center for Medical Progress, which was the organization that obtained undercover footage of high-ranking Planned Parenthood executives admitting that they engage in the purchase of dead baby body parts from abortion clinics, namely Planned Parenthood, in order to harvest them and use them for experimental scientific experimentation. David Daladine is still facing lawsuits from Planned Parenthood and STEM Express, who was, which was the organization that purchased dead baby body parts from abortion clinics. And he has been in hearings the last couple of weeks in Sacramento. And they're arguing that he obtained that footage and audio illegally 
because these were privately taped conversations, despite the fact that they were in public forums, such as restaurants, where there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, which is the defense's argument for the legality of David Daladine's actions. But the individuals involved with the purchase of baby body parts from abortions have recently just admitted again in hearings in Sacramento that they do indeed and have indeed engaged in the purchase of fetal body parts illegally from abortion clinics. So regarding the factual nature of the debate, that is happening, and it's not happening because I say it, it's happening because those who are engaging in the sales of dead baby body parts are admitting that it is so. And if you don't want to take my word for it, do your research. The hearings are going on right now in Sacramento uh, for nearly five years since the footage was initially obtained. The mainstream media's talking point, of course, was that these videos were highly, highly edited. And then the Center for Medical Progress released full three-hour unedited clips on YouTube. And now the lawyers on the other side of the aisle have admitted that these videos were not tampered with. So yes, it's happening. Yes, it's immoral. And as rational human beings who believe in the, in the dignity of human beings, we should all be opposed to the mistreatment of dead baby body parts being sold on the black market and used for scientific experimentation. In regards to the second question um, regarding why do we have laws against animal cruelty but apparently don't apply those laws against human cruelty to babies in the womb, well, this, I think, is just an example of ideas. Bad ideas have victims. And if you accept the idea culturally that human value is not intrinsic, it's not coming from the fact that you're a human being with a human nature, but it's based on arbitrarily selected criteria by a power class who gets to decide who lives and who dies, and you, you buy that narrative, you believe that word worldview, then it is logically consistent to say that the unborn child does not have a right to life. If human value is dependent on wantedness, convenience, dependency, etc. But we largely reject violence against animals, which of course leads us back to the biggest question that we should all be asking, which is what makes humans valuable in the first place? And if we're not able to answer that question, um, then we'll never receive clarity on the issue of abortion because it's just certain people applying their own standards of human equality. Hi, my name's Andrew. Do you think it is realistic to think that Roe v. Wade will get overturned and that abortion will be made illegal in the United States? And if so, what do you think needs to happen for that to happen? Yeah, good question. And of course, this is the question that's tearing the, the country apart right now, right? <laughs> this is the question that everyone is concerned with, regardless of where you find yourself in the abortion debate. Pro-lifers are excited that the pro-life movement is facing arguably their best chance to overturn Roe versus Wade. And the pro-choice movement is very frightened that the pro-life movement is facing their best opportunity to overturn Roe versus Wade. So we're all concerned with this question on some level in some way. But of course, um, it, it is clear that the this political administration has made large, has won big victories for the pro-life movement. And if you believe in human equality, I would suggest that you do celebrate some of those victories, such as ensuring conscience, conscience protections for healthcare workers and physicians who don't want to perform abortions because of their religious views, meaning we shouldn't be manipulating and coercing physicians to perform abortions if they don't want to have anything to do with that. The Trump administration recently defunded about 60 million from Planned Parenthood. Um, and every Democrat for nearly decades supported the Hyde Amendment. Almost all Democratic senators supported the Hyde Amendment, meaning that tax dollars shouldn't explicitly, specifically go to funding abortion against the religious views or moral views of certain American citizens. And now almost every Democratic presidential hopeful has promised to overturn the Hyde Amendment. So those who support abortion have gotten more and more radical, and that's due in large part to their fear that the pro-life movement is winning, and therefore women's rights, but not unborn women's rights, they should be dismembered. Born women's rights to get abortions should be protected at all costs. So I do think it's reasonable to say that um, the pro-life movement is facing the best opportunity to overturn Roe versus Wade since the legalization of Roe versus Wade. And this is why the country was so divided over the confirmation of certain Supreme Court justices, despite the fact that Judge, now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, actually has no judicial history ruling on abortion. 
meaning he has never ruled on an abortion case. And so the left had no reason to even suspect that he was this radical pro-life advocate. And in fact, there were many, many Republican Supreme Court justices. Of course, they're not supposed to be Republican or Democrat, but conservative leaning Supreme Court justices on the court in 1973 when abortion was legalized. So just because you're of the right or of the conservative movement hasn't meant historically that you'll rule in favor of the pro-life position. Um, however, obviously, that is, we have a better chance with the confirmations of Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch than we would have had with Supreme Court justices being appointed by Hillary Clinton, who obviously supports abortion to the day of birth as well. So I think it's reasonable, and I think that my generation will be the pro-life generation that overturns Roe versus Wade and ensures human equality for all human beings. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Derek. Uh, so, my question comes from a little bit earlier. Uh, you, I guess, I wasn't able to attend the demonstrations on Monday nor Tuesday, um, but I'm vaguely aware of the fact that there were uh, comparisons drawn between abortion, the Holocaust, and lynch mobs. Is that? Yes, right? that's okay. great. Um, and I guess my question is, do you think it's intellectually honest to, or that sounds very aggressive, but like, do you think that they're that comparable? Especially when at the beginning you said that um, the demonstration doesn't exist to shame anybody, but to expose them to the realities of it. Right, um, cool. So is it intellectually honest? Good question, thank you. So. Um, if you saw the display, you may have noticed one of the notifications that were on some of the images, which is that comparable does not mean identical. And the reason that the organization who puts on this display makes that point is that we don't believe they're identical. These happened at different points in American history or in German history, as a lot of the Holocaust images depict. And they happened under very different social fabrics, very different administrations. Um, and so we're not saying that they're identical at all. We're saying they're comparable, to use the term that he used. And the reason why we're saying they're comparable is this. Genocide has always entailed the dehumanization of an entire class of biological human beings that certain individuals wanted to mistreat or slaughter for political or financial or power purposes. And so if the unborn child is a human being like you and I and shares our common human nature, then their right to life ought to be as protected as African Americans should have been during Jim Crow or during slavery, as protected as Jews' lives should have been in Germany, if all of those people are human beings, because we all agree with the premise that it's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. So we're making the case that abortion is essentially another form of bigotry, because it entails born people who were born and not aborted and have a life, most of them were thankful for the fact that they weren't aborted, applying a certain criteria of human value to unborn human beings and then saying, because those unborn human beings don't meet my criteria for human value, we can mistreat them, dismember them, and kill them through the moment of birth. That's the same ideology behind the Holocaust and slavery. White racists and Nazis said that those people over there, namely African Americans and Jews, are non-persons. They rarely made the case that they weren't biologically human. Of course, some did, but they called them what? Subhuman or non-persons. And therefore, if you can convince a society that an entire class of human beings can be set aside for slaughter because they're not persons, then it becomes much easier to accept the proposition that it's okay to mistreat those human beings. So just like racism and just like the Holocaust, abortion is another form of dehumanization and bigotry that strips personhood from certain biological humans that you want to mistreat or kill. And as advocates for human equality, we should reject all of those forms of bigotry. So that's why the comparison is made. Essentially, the same justifications are offered in defense of abortion as were offered in defense of the Holocaust and slavery, though they're obviously not identical. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Lucas. Um, two quick questions. Um, first is on your reference to the debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. I was curious, 
did you use direct quotes or were you paraphrasing the debates? So the quote that I read from Abraham Lincoln was actually a piece called Fragments on Slavery, written in 1854, four years before his seven or eight debates with Stephen Douglas. But that type of reasoning was essentially the same form of argumentation that he used against Stephen Douglas in those debates. The segment that I read from his piece, Fragments on Slavery, was a direct quote. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, the second one, I was talking with a colleague of mine who was um, donating to Planned Parenthood, and one of the things that they told me was that Planned Parenthood uses an extremely small percentage of their funding to fund abortions. And when I tried to look into that, um, I found very inconsistent statistics, some saying that they used a, a very large amount, some saying that they used virtually nothing. And I'm struggling with where to turn to find the facts. Excellent. Good question. Um, so there is a argument from the pro-choice community that says that abortion is only about 2 to 3% of what Planned Parenthood does. And the, re the way that they're able to get to that statistic is by counting every service they provide to a woman as a separate service, even though the final result, the final service rendered is an abortion. So if a woman comes in for an abortion, but Planned Parenthood does an ultrasound, Planned Parenthood uh, confirms the pregnancy, Planned Parenthood confirms the age and development of the unborn child, Planned Parenthood does a sit-down um, meeting with a physician, all of these different things they count as services. So they separate one client who gets an abortion and counts her visit to Planned Parenthood as all of these different services. That's the only way that they're able to get that statistic. By the way, if you take the average cost of an abortion, it's called five, six hundred dollars, and that goes way beyond that, right? If you're in the third trimester, late second trimester, you're talking upwards of a thousand or more. Let's call it five or six hundred, and you multiply that by three hundred and thirty thousand, which is how many Planned Parenthood how many abortions Planned Parenthood for, performs every year? It's about a third of the annual abortion rate. The number you get is not consistent with any of their um, financial reports. <laughs> the reason being is because it's a lie, right? It's a fantasy. And, and so they skew their statistics and count all of the services one woman comes into when she gets an abortion as separate services so that they can say only three, uh, well, abortion is only 3% of what we do. So that's how they're able to get to that statistic. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so um, I'm pro-life, and I recently, um, so the demonstration started a conversation among me and another person um, who I found out is on the different side of the issue, um, and a question she asked me, which I've never really known how to respond to, because it's a very difficult question, um, and I was just wondering like, how you would respond to this was, um, like when someone says that if abortion is made illegal, then people will turn to like back alley abortions, like illegal ways and that that won't be safe so that right. abortion shouldn't be made illegal. Um, right. How would you respond to that? Yes, absolutely. So the question is that essentially the consequences of making abortion illegal are too unacceptable to make it illegal. Because if you make it illegal, women will be forced into dangerous back alley abortion clinics and there will be significant threat to her life given that it probably won't be a qualified, certified physician. Maybe it's being performed with a coat hanger or rusty abortion instruments. So in order to protect her life, isn't it better to keep abortion legal? Well, the only way that you can make that argument to be a rational argument is if the unborn child is not a human being. Because the consequences of making abortion illegal are, don't really matter if the act in question is the destruction of a human being. You can argue that the consequences of making killing babies illegal are unacceptable. You can make that case. But if the unborn child is a human being, then murder is wrong, regardless of the consequences of forbidding it. So essentially what that argument is saying is that because some people die trying to kill others, the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. Because some people die, being the mothers who might die obtaining illegal abortions, trying to kill others, their unborn children, the state should make it safe and legal for them to do so. The problem is that we would reject that reasoning if it was applied to any other scenario. So, for example, let's, let's assume that there were a couple bank robbers cruising around Pullman the last semester, and they had successfully robbed two banks. They attempted to rob a third one, 
And while they're running out of the bank with gobs of cash, a law-abiding citizen with a concealed carry permit pops one of the guys in the calf. His friend leaves him bleeding out, takes the cash, drives away. One of the bank robbers is bleeding out on the side of the sidewalk. How did he get injured or wounded? Well, he was prevented, he was shot for doing something illegal and immoral. So he broke the law. He did something immoral and got wounded or injured, and now his life is on the line because of that. So shouldn't we just legalize bank robber, bank robbery in order to protect the lives of bank robbers? If you're doing something illegal or immoral and you get injured or wounded in the process, the solution is not to make that act in question legal. The solution is not to do that. <laughs> One could argue that if a kid walks into a school to shoot up a school, he might get shot in the process. So shouldn't we legalize school shootings? That poor 17-year-old school shooter, he might get shot. He might get killed while doing something both illegal and immoral. Now, you all reject that. Use it. That's disgusting to insinuate that stuff. I agree. It is disgusting to insinuate that. The solution is what? Don't shoot people. Don't injure others. So the solution to making abortion illegal is, or rather, is not to keep it legal in order to protect women from getting injured. The solution is not to kill human beings. And if abortion is made illegal and women are injured or hurt in the process, well, that's sad. And I, I hope that doesn't happen. And I would do anything to prevent that from happening. She could not kill her child. She could not seek out an illegal abortion. By the way, this argument is deeply sexist and anti-feminist. The argument usually goes something like this. If abortion is made illegal, women are going to be forced into dangerous back alley abortion clinics. Really, who's forcing them? With the exception of patriarchal, disgusting men who force their girlfriends to get abortions, which is a minority of abortions, and they should be condemned and held legally, legally responsible as such, with the exception of those, women choose to schedule their own abortions. They choose to seek it out. Again, I will condemn any situation where she's being forced or coerced into doing that. But the majority of abortions are her seeking that abortion out. So to say that in a post-Roe world where abortion is made illegal, women are just going to be forced. They're just not going to have any option but to pursue an abortion. is a deeply sexist argument that says that true femininity is pursuing the slaughter of unborn children illegally. Rather than assuming and giving women the benefit of the doubt that they are strong enough and empowered enough to choose motherhood for the child that they are already a mother to and not seek out their illegal killing. So if you're a true feminist and believe in the dignity and inherent worth of women, you should be supporting their rights to be mothers to the children they're already mothers to and not saying they're just going to be forced to obtain illegal abortions and get their lives or bodies wounded or hurt in the process. But abortion's wrong regardless of the consequences of forbidding it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hi there. Um, I hope you're having a good day. Um, <laughs> Pretty good, thank you. So I was just wondering, you brushed up on Roe v. Wade a couple times, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make sure that you knew why Roe v. Wade is such a seminal Supreme Court case, and also that if we override it, or we overrule it, and that the 14th Amendment's due process clause, that we don't have liberty and bodily autonomy for our own decisions. Like, what are some of the ramifications of overturning that? So I guess my question is, like, if abortion, if the government has the power to ban all abortion no matter what, what's stopping the government from mandating abortions? Right. Well, do you believe that the government should be involved in making, let's say, um, physical abuse of your toddlers illegal? Sorry? Do you believe that the government has a role in making child abuse illegal, like, you know, bruising your three-year-olds, just socking them in the face? Do you believe the government has a vested interest in keeping that illegal? I think so. Because right, because we should protect people's right to life and liberty, right? And that compromises their right to life and liberty. So the pro-life position to what, the pro-life response to what you're asking is that abortion is the worst form of child abuse. Because abortion not only bruises and wounds a child at the very early stage in their physical development, but abortion is actually child abuse that ends in homicide. It's the worst form of child abuse. So if we accept the premise that it is always wrong to intentionally harm or kill innocent human beings, we would have to intellectually and consistently apply that to all biological humans, whether they happen to be unborn or born. So if I were to sort of just create a thought experiment and ask you sort of bring your question back to you by saying, well, if the government, you know, if they can, if they can make child abuse illegal, what keeps them from making it legal? 
you know, now again, they could do that, but, but most American citizens would rise up and vote those people out of office because they would say, you're morally unfit <laughs> to be a politician. You're morally unfit to be a political leader because you believe that an entire class of toddlers can be set aside for parental abuse. And so that's what is great about living in a constitutional republic is if the government chooses to use power to pursue certain immoral behaviors or choices, we can vote them out, right? So of course, to answer your question, could the government do that? Yes, I guess the government could mandate that you have to have abortions, but even pro-choice people, I think vast swaths of the pro-choice movement would say that's wrong because they believe in women's bodily autonomy. And so therefore they shouldn't be forced to get an abortion, right? Because it should be up to the woman. Well, I'm saying that as an advocate of all lives, I believe that female lives matter. And because I believe that female lives matter, I believe that female lives matter at the moment that they are females. And that would be the most defenseless females, unborn females, baby females. Unborn children are indeed the most defenseless members of the human society. So that would be my response. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm going to have to be the devil's advocate and ask you a question that's going to challenge you, at least in some way. Between the following three ways to die, which is the worst? The first, to die at five years old, starving and diseased because... Your mother could not afford to feed you, let alone herself, barely, nor could she afford health care. The second, to die at 15 years old from a suicide, with no one in your family loving you, and all of you agreeing that you would have been better off not being born. And the third, to die at five weeks in the womb before you've developed a central nervous system. Which is the worst way to die? Yes. Okay, that's your question? Yeah. Well, um, I think it's entirely subjective because um, it might depend on the person being killed, right? So someone who kills themselves, that's very quick, typically, unless they botch it, unless they botch the suicide, in which yes, case they're dying for, for... Well, let me answer, let me answer. Um, if, you're, if you're a five-year-old, I guess, how are you killed? And then if you're ripped limb from limb in, in the womb, but you don't have any... Um, that you can't feel anything yet, then you wouldn't feel it. But all those things are really beside the point if we accept the premise that it's always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. There, are, there is a disorder and disease called uh, congenital analgesia, and I may not have pronounced the second word correctly, but essentially um, there are some born people who have this disorder and they can't feel anything. It's literally, they cannot. So you could slit their wrist and they would start bleeding out and they would just look at you. <laughs> they wouldn't feel anything. So, I mean, would it still be wrong to kill them? Yes. Is that a horrible way to die for them? I mean, from a pain standpoint, no. But if they know they're dying, that could be pretty, pretty uh, traumatic information to know you're dying, can't feel it, and you're about to die. So uh, really, the whole question is just kind of beside the point because it's wrong to kill people regardless of their level of pain or tolerance for said injustice. But... One thing I will say is that the way we are able to justify things that are otherwise considered wrong is by stating that the alternative is, in some way, less morally acceptable. We generally argue that, for instance, it's wrong to lie, right? I think most of us can agree that, right? But say, if you were... I think the classic example is... Uh, well, just for, time, just for time, let's just get to your question. Did you have another one? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question then. Thanks. I'm back. Hey, welcome back. Yeah. And they, he doesn't have a question, so I'm not. Excellent. No worries. Um, so I had a couple other questions. So uh, really, I guess, basic and also not basic one is um, how do you define innocence? How do I define innocence? Yeah. Guilty well, of crime. Like, guilty of wrongdoing. Like, um... Cause I'm sorry, not, not guilty? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, if you don't mind me talking a little bit, um... <laughs> I get you on the moment. I, for example, if, say, um, somebody with concealed carry is attacked by a man with a gun, is the law-abiding citizen with concealed carry all right to shoot the person who's attacking them? 
So yes, as I mentioned when I addressed my first premise, I said that I'm not saying that all killing is always wrong. So if a guy walks into my apartment with a loaded firearm and threatens to kill my wife or son, and I am armed or I have a chance to grab a firearm, I will not hesitate to shoot him. He put himself in that position by threatening to murder my wife or son. I did not put him in that position. And I have a right to defend my family, <laughs> certainly. Um, so at that point, he would not be an innocent human being. Do I wish to kill him? No. I hope I never have to shoot someone, much less if, that, if me shooting someone leads to their killing. That would be traumatic. I don't want to have to live with that. And I hope I don't have to ever do that. But would I do that if somebody's threatening my life or my family's life? Yes, without hesitation. And damn you for coming in here and making me do that by threatening my family. So you wouldn't be an innocent person right there. And you should expect to be retaliated against when you try to seek to um, initiate violence or harm to, uh, to an innocent human being. Um, is, it, is it all right if I were to like, continue? With it? Sure, do you have another question? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of continuing with the same question, I guess. Okay. Um, I, I guess going... Or what if it was, hey, would you say the same thing about, say, someone with a rock or someone who's approaching you with their fists, but they don't have a weapon, but they definitely intend to beat you up? Would that be acceptable to kill them? Well, I think the level of the threat dictates the level of the response. Um, and, and so if, if someone was attacking me or my family with, with like a small stone, <laughs> you know, or uh, with a butter knife or something like that, I, I certainly wouldn't try to shoot him in the forehead, right? Yeah. Um, I, might, I might, you know, maybe I've been going to the gym, maybe I've been working on Taekwondo, maybe I just knocked the bleep out of him, you know? Um, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I am armed. And I, and I just shoot his toe and his foot, and I try to just, like, stop him, but I, I do not wish to kill him. So the level of threat dictates the level of response, certainly. But again, I mean, at the end of the day, nobody snuck an AK-47 into the womb, right? So the baby's not shooting back. Yeah. It, now, of course, you could say, well, what about if the baby threatens a mother life? And we can address it if you'd like. Um, that might be the objection to that. But the baby's certainly innocent. The baby's not shooting or killing anyone. Uh, and so the comparisons don't really, don't really well, hold up. Was, what I was going to say is um, both of them are, are guilty of crime. Both of them are not innocent. Yet, in one case, they are at a level of guilt where it's permissible, that most people would agree it's permissible to kill them, whereas somebody would say, just attacking their face. Is that where you're leading? You're saying the unborn child can threaten the mother's yeah, life? Yeah, that's essentially Okay, true. okay, all right. It's all right. You can cut to the quick. I'll, I can answer that question. So, um, in a situation where an unborn child poses a threat to the mother's life, um, then the conversation does change. If it poses a, a threat to the woman's health, because you probably are all, all aware, people say abortion should be condemned, many people say, unless it's a threat to the mother's life or health. Well, a pregnancy always affects your health or threatens your health. Some women have very difficult pregnancies and are bedridden for all three trimesters, as you all well know. And some women have a pregnancy glow. And, uh, you know, my wife hates those people. You know, so um, my wife was, you know, throwing up multiple times a day. You know, so it, it changes. So, but it all, but the bottom line is what? It always impacts your health, right? So the, a pregnancy impacting your health is not a good reason to get an abortion. And we can usually prescribe um, certain treatments or certain solutions to women who are in a lot of pain to make it a little less, a little more tolerable. But it's not threatening their life. Okay, now, so let's set aside health. What if the pregnancy is threatening the woman's life? What if she could die? Well, thanks to medical technologies and scientific advancements, we can almost always save the life of the mother and the unborn child. Almost always. Um, and for you men who are fathers or will be fathers in the future, and for you women who are mothers or seek to be mothers in the future, you should be very grateful that you live in 2019, frankly, because we can almost always save the life of the mother and the child. The position in which we know we can't save both human beings that pretty much we always, we always know we can't would be called an ectopic pregnancy. Right? And that is when the unborn child, the zygote, the embryo at a very early stage in their physical development, implants in the fallopian tube rather than the uterus. Now, notice I didn't call it a fertilized egg because that's a misnomer. After fertilization, if you remember high school biology, sperm and egg actually die. So to say fertilized egg is actually a misnomer because there's no more egg <laughs> and there's no more sperm. That's a zygote, which is a human being at a very early stage in their physical development. And the unborn is supposed to travel through the fallopian tube and implant in the uterine wall, which is what happened to all of us. In an ectopic pregnancy, that unborn child implants in the fallopian tube. As that child begins to develop, as he or she will, that will put significant stress on the fallopian tube. And left untreated, it will cause the fallopian tube to burst. 
Very few women survive that unless they're like immediately in a hospital already. They will begin to bleed internally and they will die fairly quickly. The unborn child will also die at that point after the fallopian tube bursts. So if you don't do anything, how many human being lives are lost? Oh. Two. If you don't do anything, you lose two lives. So the pro-life movement has always contended that it is better to act to save one life than refuse to act and lose two lives. At this point, some pro-choice advocates will say to a pro-life individual, so see, there are some situations where you accept abortion. But the pro-life movement and actually the medical field and profession does not even define that as an abortion. Abortion is properly defined as the intentional killing of the unborn human being. But in that case, in an ectopic pregnancy, what are we intentionally doing? We're intentionally saving the life of the mother. When we perform a salpingectomy or a salpingostomy, which either creates a small incision in the fallopian tube and removes the early embryo or removes the entire fallopian tube, our intent is not to end the life of the child. Our intent is to save the life of the mother. So the death of the baby is a foreseen but unintended consequence. And if you know anything about law, intention is very important. If I unintentionally kill you in an accident, I'm not charged in the same way as if I did that intentionally. So we're intentionally saving the life of the mother. So that's not even medically or objectively defined as an abortion. There may be extenuating circumstances in which a pregnant woman, uh, in which the unborn child poses a significant threat to the woman's life, but there are very few, and we can almost always say mother and child by inducing early labor and giving the baby the best chance and not dismembering them in the womb or performing a cesarean section. It's only in the case of ectopic pregnancy that we know a priori we cannot save both mother and child. But that's obviously fundamentally different than someone pulling a gun on me and my family and forcing me to respond in kind. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Hello, and I apologize ahead of time. I wasn't able to... Um... No worries. Your talk. But, no worries. So you may have addressed this already. But um, if in the future Roe v. Wade is overturned and abortion is illegal in this country, what would be a just penalty for uh, abortion? And there, are, there would be two guilty parties in that case, the mother and the physician who performed it. Um, how, how should the difference, what would, first of all, what would be the difference in right. culpability in the two sure. parties? And how should law recognize that difference? Sure. Good question. Thank you. We did briefly address the um, possible eventual reality of the overturn of Roe versus Wade, but we didn't address um, certain consequences that may be imposed legally in that situation. So that is a good question. And the answer I'm going to give you is actually an answer that, unfortunately, many pro-life advocates are not comfortable with. But that has nothing to do with the level of response. And if we're going to consistently apply an ethic that says, it is always wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings, then we have to apply similar or equal consequences to individuals who arrange the death of innocent human beings. But firstly, let me state, because this is obviously controversial, the pro-life movement does not support the rounding up of women who had abortions when they were legal and punishing them now that abortion is illegal, okay? <laughs> Many people on the left or members of the pro-choice community like to sometimes accuse pro-life individuals of holding that position. By and large, the pro-life movement does not believe that, that if abortion is made illegal, we need to round up all the women who had abortions prior to its illegalization and punish them, okay? So you can set that aside. We don't believe that. Now, we do believe that those abortions were still morally wrong, but unfortunately, they were legal at that time. And so we can't retroactively punish women who did something illegal and that often involved a certain level of ignorance. Many women know what they're doing. Many women don't know what they're doing. And over 90% of abortions are performed in the first trimester. It's also the trimester where there's the most public support for abortion. And it's also the trimester in which it is the easiest to lie to women that it's just a blob of tissue because they can't feel their baby kick yet, usually. Um, so... 
We don't support rounding up women and retroactively punishing them if abortion was made illegal. However, what do you do when abortion is made illegal? Now, of course, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, it goes back to the states. And this is why many very blue pro-abortion states are essentially codifying Roe v. Wade into state law and making abortion legal through the day of birth in their state, preparing for the eventuality of the overturn of Roe v. Wade so that they can raise their hand and say, we've protected women's rights. Unless you're unborn, you're screwed. But... And this is why, of course, more Republican states are trying to enshrine more protections for the unborn um, at earlier and early stages so that if abortion is made, if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that state can say they protected unborn children. But the primary legal concept at play in a scenario where abortion is made illegal is this concept called the meeting of the minds, which is essentially, was there a level of awareness for the action being committed or perpetrated? Or was it done in ignorance? This is why I just said earlier, intention is very important from a legal standpoint. So if a mother is told by, a 16-year-old mother is told by Planned Parenthood, who has a vested interest in performing abortions, literally, financially, right, that um, it's just fetal tissue, we're just suctioning out some tissue, um, or maybe, sorry, it would be an illegal abortion clinic in this case, um, and, and it, it'll be fine, and it, it, it doesn't have a beating heart, it's not even a person yet, and her parents are saying the same thing, or, her, or they're pressuring her, would we charge her with first-degree murder? No, we wouldn't. Um, there hasn't been a meeting of the minds, there hasn't been an awareness of wrongdoing. Um, secondly, the pro-life movement believes that the woman is always a second victim. Because, as it turns out, killing unborn children is not good for women's health. It's unnatural. This is why you have to forcibly dilate the cervix. Because, as it turns out, the cervix was not meant to be forcibly dilated before birth. That baby was supposed to be protected in the womb. So, naturally, abortion is, by definition, unnatural biologically. So, there, were, there can be, and often is, physical repercussions for the woman's body in abortion. But, if a woman obtains an illegal abortion... We would not charge her in the same way that we would charge the abortionist because she didn't actually dismember her child, did she? Unless she did a self-induced abortion, she didn't actually kill her baby. Now, the pro-life movement believes she's culpable because she probably scheduled it, right? Like I said earlier, unless she's being coerced and forced by someone else, she seeks out the abortion. Another way to put that is that she arranges the death of her unborn child. So how would we treat a mother who, after she grew tired of raising her two-year-old toddler due to physical exhaustion and financial resources, she brought her toddler to a clinic that put that child to sleep and then dismembered him and threw him in the trash? I think all people, regardless of their opinions on abortion, would say that she should be held legally responsible. She was complicit in the death of her child. But it was the clinic who killed her toddler that should be held responsible for first-degree murder. But the mother who arranged the death of her toddler wouldn't be off the hook, would she? And none of us really want her to be off the hook, frankly. So if the unborn child is a distinct living and whole human being with the same level of humanity and dignity as born people then we need to charge the people who arrange the death of unborn children and actually kill those unborn children in the same way that we would do so for parents who arrange the death of their toddlers and the people who kill their toddlers. The only difference is a mother who arranges the death of her toddler is obviously fully aware that that's a person. And that's why we need to ensure that there's a meeting of minds, and that would have to be done in the courtroom and according to the law to, and, and, and in juries or, to see, did this mother of this unborn child know that this was a human being? Or was her boyfriend and father telling her it was just a blob of tissue, you're only six weeks pregnant, it's not a baby, it's just tissue? So intent is also important. Does that help? But if you're going to be intellectually consistent, you have to charge abortionists with first-degree murder when abortion is made illegal, and the mothers or fathers as complicit in the same way that we would to parents who bring their toddler somewhere to be killed. Yes? So my question was on the viability. Okay. You said your son was a year and a half old? Yeah, he's approaching two now, yeah. So with the viability argument, could you say that if you left your son alone for one day, that he will live autonomously? Yeah, he would die as, yeah, pretty as, quickly. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so what... What would you say to the cutoff for viability? Like, 
five or six. Right. Well, I just reject viability a, as the standard for human value, right? But unfortunately, people like David Boonin, um, a professor at University of Colorado, I believe, who wrote the book A Defense of Abortion, and Peter Singer, many of these people accept the killing of infants after they're born. Peter Singer, namely. He's, he's the most popular for doing this. This is why ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. If you accept the premise that human value is dependent on wantedness, convenience, viability, size, level of development, or whatever the criteria are, if you accept a criteria designed by born people who weren't aborted to justify the killing of unborn people to abort them, then if you consistently apply that standard, it applies intellectually perfectly to born people. That's why I say the pro-choice ideology is a perfect justification for the killing of born people. Because there's nothing meaningful about moving six inches through the birth canal. There's nothing value-giving about the one minute before birth and the one minute after birth. There's nothing, there's nothing value-giving or meaningful about those differences. That baby could still be unwanted, inconvenient, and certainly not viable. We all know infants aren't viable. We all know my son isn't viable. Meaning that if I, he, he's dependent on us to live. So if you, if you say that's the criteria for human value and that's what I use to justify abortion, guess what? You just justified infanticide. You just justify the homicide of three-year-olds. And so if you don't like the consequences of the intellectual application of your pro-choice worldview, then it's not the fault of your opponents, pro-lifers. It's the fault of your ideology. And as C.S. Lewis said, the true progressive is the person who goes back and examines their ideas again to move on pig-headed and insisting that your worldview is correct, despite the fact that you don't like the consequences of your worldview, is not progressive. The progressive is someone who wants to make progress, realizes that they've gone down the wrong road and needs to get on the right road if they don't like the consequences of their ideology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, an argument I run into a lot when I'm talking with people about abortion who disagree with me is they, they always like to bring up, well, what if the woman was raped? Now, I would assume that you would still hold the same position, but I'm curious what, um, how you would go about sure. responding to that. Yeah, good question. So the pro-life movement believes that abortion is wrong for the same reasons that rape is wrong. We're opposed to rape. We're opposed to abortion. Why? Because we reject violence against innocent human beings. And both rape and abortion are violence against human beings. Now, obviously, for a woman who is raped and is now pregnant, I believe that as a society, regardless of religious affiliation or your positions on abortion, we need to have the utmost compassion and care for that woman. I have no idea what that would be like. I don't claim to know what that is like. What I claim to say is that children should not be forced to suffer for the crimes of their father. The only guilty party in that scenario is the rapist. And I support punishment against guilty people who have perpetrated violence against innocent human beings. And one of the many talking points of people who defend abortion is that what if that baby conceived in rape ends up looking like the rapist, having the facial structure of the rapist? And so pro-life individuals are told that they're disgusting bigots because they would force a mother to stare into the face of her rapist every day. And that would increase her trauma that she already endured from the rape. And then they say to us, how could that be pro-life? But if that's the road you want to go down, then you should be aware that children don't develop facial structure that will be recognizable for the rest of their life until they're two or three years old. For the first year of my son's life, everyone said he looks like me. Now, everyone's been saying he looks like my wife. And she's pretty stoked about that. So he looks a lot different. So here's the solution. Let's allow children conceived in rape to be born and give them two or maybe three years. And then at two and a half or three years old, if they look like their mother, we'll say, congratulations, you have a right to life. But if they look like their rapist father, well, we'll just take them to Planned Parenthood's new infanticide alarm and we'll have them dismembered. And we all say, that's disgusting. Those who support abortion in the case of rape immediately say, no, you can't do that. Why? Because toddlers are human beings. You can't kill toddlers. Exactly. I believe that children, whether born or unborn, should not be forced to suffer for the crimes of their father. Your value does not come from the circumstances of your conception. 
It comes from the fact that you're a distinct living and whole human being with a human nature. And we as a society have largely always accepted the premise that it's always wrong to intentionally commit violence or murder against innocent human beings. In a pregnancy that arises from rape, there's three parties, the mother, the rapist, and the unborn child. Pro-choice individuals largely do not support giving the death penalty to rapists. And our country pretty much never, as far as I'm aware, gives the death penalty to rapists. It's not a death penalty crime, which is very, very interesting because that means that pro-choice individuals refuse to give the death penalty to the only guilty human, but they believe we should give the death penalty to the unborn child who's just as innocent as his or her mother. So abortion is wrong for the same reason that rape is wrong. It's barbarism, and they both entail violence against innocent human beings. Statistically, we found that women who obtain abortions after rape end up with significantly more trauma than those who were raped and gave life to their babies. But that's really beside the point, because your happiness from choosing life for your baby conceived in rape has nothing to do with the morality of killing babies conceived in rape. It's wrong to kill babies conceived in rape, just as it would be wrong to kill toddlers conceived in rape, whether the mother has a higher degree of trauma or not from obtaining that abortion. So if you're an advocate of human equality, you should oppose abortion for the same reasons you oppose rape. Thank you. Yes. Let's do the last question. All right, so how would you respond to the argument um, that maybe like, what if the mother can't afford to raise the child, and if the child was born, then it will have like, a worse life than if it had never been born? Right. At the end of the day, almost every single argument for abortion assumes that the unborn child is not a human being. Almost every single argument. And the way that we know that, and I think I've showed you that tonight, is by applying the same argument to the killing of toddlers. And everyone says, I reject the application of my reasoning to the killing of toddlers. And so my response is, then there's something wrong with your ideology. It's not the pro-life movement's fault. If your worldview has consequences you don't like, you should reject your worldview. So if you accept the killing of unborn children because they might pose financial difficulties to their parents, then do you support the right of parents to kill their toddlers when they get expensive? And everyone says no. And then we say, what's the difference between the toddler that you reject killing due to financial struggles, but the unborn child that you support giving the right of parents to kill due to financial struggles. And the only differences that a pro-choice individual will probably point out are a set of criteria or functions that they have decided are value giving in the first place without making an argument for why the possession of those faculties is value giving in the first place. So they beg the question by assuming that the unborn child is not a human person without proving that the unborn child is not a human person. If you reject killing toddlers due to financial difficulties, you need to equally reject killing unborn children due to financial difficulties if the unborn child is a human being. If you care about objectivity and the science of embryology, you have to accept the premise that the unborn child is a human being and abortion intentionally kills a human being. Thank you guys for your time. I'll hang around after if you have more questions. Thanks for tuning in to this week's special episode of Unaborted with my lecture called Stump the Pro-Lifer at Washington State University. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. And of course, listen to it again and continue to train and equip your mind to defend life because the other side, the pro-choice movement has been far more committed to equipping and training secular young people to defend abortion than we as the church and sometimes pro-life movement have been to equipping and training our young people to defend life. And our passion to defend life ought to far outstrip the pro-choice movement's passion to defend abortion. So tune in next week for a continued conversation on defending our pro-life beliefs and, and wading through the cultural wars on the front lines of the pro-life movement. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to sethgruber.com. That's S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in boy, E com. Sign up for my newsletter, check out my training videos, and continue to get resources and training to your inbox to defend life. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Hey.